Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Today's guest is Jeff Niswish. He's joining us from Tampa, Florida, and we won't hold that against him, but uh, he's got a lot of great information. He's a he's an author. He's a coach. Uh, he does all kinds of things and spent many years in the realm of the of of practicing law, developed his own business, and now has landed at this time of life and is coaching others on how to build successful businesses and how to operate great businesses. The guts of what we talk about today is holding people accountable. It's really an interesting concept of conversation and how you can change the dialogue as you're holding people accountable and getting them to uh, commit to to outcomes. I'm pretty interested in this conversation, and I can't wait to share all of the information with you. So grab a cup of coffee and join us for this conversation. We got so much to say, we got a podcast to make, we're sipping on lattes, and it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, excited to have you on board. You were obviously recommended to us from uh, Marcy Rader, who was a fantastic guest a couple of episodes ago. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Chad. I'm really pleased to be here with you. Now, you were ju- we were just talking a few moments ago. You're, you are down in Tampa, Florida right now, and I will try my best not to hold that against you because of somebody else that I know from Tampa. Uh, but uh, but we're, we're, we're glad that obviously through uh, our virtual connection, we're able to, to chat uh, today. Well, you know, I never thought that moving to Tampa would make me be hated by others, but <laughs> coming from Cleveland, where I used to live, where we couldn't win a championship, but every 70 years, and now Tampa has won two championships and come in second in the last four months. And another, I think people in the world are hating on me. I said, just moved here. Leave me alone. Well, it has nothing to do with the sports teams, but we'll we'll get to that at, at, at another conversation. Um, <laughs> what, what we like to do with our guests is we like to do rapid fire, five randomly selected questions just to get under your skin with unknown point values. Are you ready? Love it. Here we go. Number one, what are you curious about lately? <laughs> I am curious about, this is very top of mind. I did a video this morning. I'm curious about the nature of blind spots, like people blind spots, and the fact that everybody knows they have a blind spot, Mm. yet in their day-to-day interactions, act as if they don't. Like if you, we all know, we have, we say, we joke around and say, you know, I, I don't know what I don't know. Yep. So we all know that. But in our actions, we're always so confident that we know exactly what's going on, the whole perspective, the whole picture. Like, how do you know you have blind spots, but you act as if you don't have any? That's mm. my curiosity today. Very cool. That's very, uh, very eye opening. All right. Uh, next question is What is a question that you wish people would ask you? <laughs> That's funny. Um, <sighs> Because I love questions. The question I wish people would ask me is, I don't get a lot of people that ask me why questions. People ask me a lot of what questions, so I bring in the why, but I'm always amazed because that's usually my first question with others is, tell me the why behind whatever it is you're engaged in. Very cool. I like it. Um, number three, what if, if you didn't have to sleep, what would you do with the extra eight hours in a day? <laughs> That's an awesome question. Um, if, if things were different, I would sit, I would go watch uh, non, I would go sit in a the theater and watch Broadway shows like three in a row for about eight to 10 hours. Wow. Okay. Like you like Broadway shows that much. Big fan, yep. Very, very much. What's, what's the fav- what's your what's your favorite show that you've seen? Uh, the best show that you've Hamilton seen? is now number one for me, but a very close second is a show called Dear Evan Hansen that I just rave about to the whole world. All right, number four. What is something that people don't know about you? <laughs> That's a tough one because I am really open. Ah, oh, wow. Um, gosh, they know everything about me. <laughs> What do people not know about me? A lot of people do not know that in high school, I was in the show choir, not just the regular choir, but a small group of folks who went around and did shows different places. 
So I was a singer, a little bit of a dancing in there, and that uh, I used to wear platform shoes and leisure polyester leisure shirts with highly flammable, very colorful shirts. This is back in the '70s, so not everybody knows that one. There you go. Well, there that probably goes into your uh, your love of uh, the Broadway shows. It's all connected. Yes, it is. See, we're just digging into all kinds of fun stuff here, and we haven't even really started the conversation yet. <laughs> and I didn't even have to talk about the arrests. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last question, number five. What is the most useful thing that you've bought this past year? <laughs> I've bought a lot of wine this year. That's incredibly useful, but that that's kind of easy. Um, what's the most useful thing that I have bought this year? Uh, There we go. It is related to that. I bought, and you can see a corner of it right here. I bought a 66-bottle wine cooler. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So it keeps the good wine chilled. There you go. And it's right there, easily accessible for you as well. It is, frighteningly so. You can almost see a little wine peeking its way out there but all unopened all unopened very cool well congratulations you pass rapid fire uh we'll give you a score of uh 796 so congratulations yeah, is that the highest ever though i gotta know is that the highest ever probably probably <laughs> that's um, a question i learned from my dad and i always said the score doesn't matter as long as i pass yes yeah, as, as long and as long as i won actually that's really <laughs> that's what, right. what matters well cool jeff thank you for uh again for being here today so uh you are an author, um, keynote speaker, uh, uh, lover of lavender. Uh, lavender of lavender. Yeah. Yep. Coach, a coach too. <laughs> a coach. Uh, how did you get into what you're doing? How, what, what kind of brought you to this point in, in life? Well, I'd love to tell you that it was a great plan, brilliantly executed, <laughs> uh, but it was neither. It was more like a car wreck. All right. uh, I'm a fully recovered lawyer. Uh, I used to practice law for 17 years. I've been out of it for going on my 20th year now. But I used to, I like to tell people it's kind of like I was driving down the road at a high rate of speed, which I tend to do. Mm-hmm. The car left the road, flipped a few times, but miraculously or synchronistically, the car landed on its wheels. Car was damaged but drivable. Mm-hmm. The driver, me, was bumped, bruised, and probably even had a few broken bones, but it was pointing in a direction, and I drove that way. (laughs) And that is more honest and accurate than people want to believe until I tell the whole story, and they go, wow, that really is true. Yeah. I go, yeah, it is. So you were in, you were practicing law and then turned into uh, this. So is, are a lot of these lessons from um, practicing law or this is just, just life experience as a whole? Most of it's life experience as a whole, a, a willingness to, to make shifts in my life. You know, I, I worked for a big law firm, very safe, so-called safe and secure, became a partner there. That was my goal. I was maybe 20 or 33 years old. It was like, okay, you've achieved your life goal. Now what? Mm. And I realized I wanted to be in leadership and didn't see that happening. So I said, well, if I want to lead. I got to start my own thing. So I started my own law firm and did that really successfully. And then decided that I hated being a lawyer. Uh, I loved the business side of law, but didn't like the practice and said, I can't do something I don't love. So I walked, I walked away from all of it. I mean, all the success, the labels, the trappings, the, I even even beat the legal system and had a really good balance in my life, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't happy. And I went on this journey and the journey took me to another business startup, a a big business failure where I learned a lot about myself more than anything. Mm -hmm. Then I got into business development, did that a while, but I kept sort of planting these seeds of things I liked, like writing a book here and there. And Someone called and said, I read your book. Do you do coaching? Mm. And I gave the right answer, which is, yes, I do. Absolutely. And that's how I got here. (laughs) Believe it, that's actually how I got here was that kind of conversation. So it was really about becoming a listener in life and listening to the voices and the messages and following versus figuring it out. Okay, so you you were telling me before we got started that uh, you're working on your fifth book currently. Fifth book. What what was the first book uh, about? When and when did you release that? 
The first book came out in 2007. Uh, it was for lawyers on how to run their law firms like a business. Okay. Because that's the part I loved, and it was called Think Again, Innovative Approaches, uh, Innovative Approaches for the Business of Law. Okay. I'm interested in this, and you said you like why questions. So yeah. why would you write a book, if you were a successful lawyer running your own law firm, why would you write a book to tell other lawyers how to run a successful law firm or run their law firm like a business? Um, well, your, your question sounds crazy to me. <laughs> and, and I get that because when you said that, I said, well, why wouldn't I? Uh -huh. Well, because I'm helping everybody else do better. Mm -hmm. That's all I cared about. And I thought I had something worth sharing. And I said, let me share it. Um, I didn't, because I've never really looked at people as competitors. Mm hmm we're all just doing different things in a different way and there's plenty for everybody. So that question's like foreign to me. Like, why wouldn't I do that? Yeah. It's interesting. So in, in the locksmith and security realm in which we uh, play as a, as a business, it has been very intriguing to me. And what you just said kind of resonated very quickly because uh, the typical thing, so I'm a, I'm a lawyer or I'm a security professional and I decide that I want to have my own business but at the heart, I'm a security professional or a lawyer, and the business side of things is the second kind of thing. You have to figure that out and learn. And so not everybody is primarily a business uh, operator first or a, a business philosophy first. So I can understand that process, and I've, I've been around that. You can see a lot of really good security professionals that don't really have good the on the focus on the business side. So being able to kind of bring those two sides of the uh, of the perspective together makes the industry better as a whole, right? It does. And and, and that industry and it's probably true in a lot of industries. But I'm going to say especially the legal is an example, accounting's another one. Mm -hmm. People learn how to do the job, but most of them didn't even take a class on business, let alone study business and leadership and I'm here. To, I learn every day. You know, I have a podcast and one of the reasons I have a podcast is so I can learn mm -hmm. and I listen and I read and I ask questions and I observe. But a lot of people who are really good at doing something, a lot of times they don't even like the business side. Mm -hmm. I was the opposite. I really like the business side and, and like the practice of law a lot less, it turns out. Yeah, it, it's it's funny that you say that. So years ago, when we started our podcast, it was we started it for a very specific reason to connect with people, to share ideas, and to create content that would be relevant to our customer base. And I and I've told many people this over the years. The reason that we have continued to do so, and uh, and how the 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 space has continued to grow for us, is it has been an educational experience for us. I, I get an opportunity to talk like fo to folks like yourself and uh, other business uh, leaders and owners and people that are doing really interesting things in the marketplace by having these conversations. So it is a massive education piece. Yeah, right on, man. Right on. All right. So uh, it, when it comes to running a business, when you so you, you're you you're a good you're good at the craft of doing whatever it is. Now you've got to switch over to the business side. Obviously, you just said you know leadership comes into play, uh, hiring, uh, you know, building a team. All of those things are coming into play if you're going to continue to grow. If, if that's on your your trajectory, I, I got something here and I want to grow it. So when that happens, what is the, the typical process that people struggle with, maybe especially in the, in the, the, uh, in the, um, the law side of things, but just as a whole, you, you're dealing with businesses on a regular basis as a coach, I'm sure. So what do you see people struggling with? What are those, what are those decisions that they're, they're struggling with along that path? Well, there's, there's a lot of them. The ones that come to mind first is a mindset. I think too often people forget, and the pun was intended, people forget that they're in a people business. I don't care what you make or what you sell or what you create. It doesn't matter whether you have a product or a service, mm. but you have people that work for you. And what I think there's this trap that people forget that and they, they get caught up in processes and systems which are critical to a business to make them more profitably profitable, more effective, more efficient, more consistent. But it's about people. Mm -hmm. And too often I see people in business that forgot the people part of business. Mm -hmm. You know, I had someone on a podcast recently 
It was so hysterical. He said he was telling a story of a client of his who was an engineer who made this comment. He said, I got promoted and I realized that leadership is a relationship thing. Almost like that was some wisdom that came down from the mountaintops. Like, really, you figured out that it's about relationships Mm -hmm. and relationships we have with people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the biggest things is we forget that it's about people. And as as we're owners, and a lot of times if we're an owner, we start with nobody but us, right? Or a small group and we add people as we grow. Mm -hmm. But as we're adding people, we can forget the people side and we're not intentional about our people. We just basically say, come in and do a good job. Why aren't you happy? Mm -hmm. Because you haven't treated me like a person. You treated me like a highly valued resource, but I want to be a person here. So that's one of the biggest things is forgetting that you lead people. Can you copy this key? That's a question we get asked about 3,422 times a year. And how can you actually be sure that the person who asked that question is supposed to get a copy of that key? Well, we think you should always know who can copy your keys to your business and your home, because it could be your neighbor, an old employee, a contractor, or even worse, your mother-in-law. At LockDock Security, we believe in protected key systems, so you always know who has a copy of your key. To find out more, visit LockDock.net or stop by our Charlotte location. LockDock Security helping you protect your people and your property. So going down the people side, which is, is, is very intriguing. I've, I've had conversations with people over and over again, and I I don't at a point consider that I'm in the business of security any longer. I'm in the people development business. That's, that's part of, 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 uh, as a whole. And and I, I really appreciate the fact that you point that out is a mind shift change because when you can fully realize that, then the, the lid of the business changes dramatically because you're now investing in people versus uh, investing in profits and and loss and and focusing on those those things which are important obviously but if you have the right people in your organization and you're building those people up then you're going to have a great outcome you will and that's the, that is the real challenge i see chad because it's easy to say it it's a lot harder to put it in practice mm-hmm. like mm. i'm a believer that um leadership ought to be people first. I believe the best cultures are people first and that that's literal. That means you make decisions thinking about what's best for our people first, not, and in fact, that comes ahead of profits. Mm -hmm. It comes ahead of customers because knowing that when you put your people first and you develop them and you engage them and you empower them, you're going to reap the financial rewards. You're going to have the great clients and customers. You know, I always say your clients and customers can't have a better experience than you're giving your people. Mm -hmm. So are Mm -hmm. you focused on that experience or aren't you focused externally? So I just, I'm encouraging leaders to get more internally focused on themselves and how they're leading. Are they trustworthy? Are they building trust? Are are they, you know, are they engaging their people, empowering them, helping to develop them? That's what leadership to me is all about. And that's how you win at business by taking care of your people. All right. So you said that this is something that's harder to put into practice. What are some things that you're coaching people on or some some ideas, some things that people can actually tangibly apply going, okay, so I I fall in that category. I, I understand what you're saying, Jeff. Now, what can I do starting tomorrow to start down that path? Uh, I'll give you my big three. All right. My big three. Number one is to understand the most important thing you can do is to build trust. And you should never assume trust, but we assume trust versus focus on building it. And all every organization has trust issues. Mm-hmm. Whatever issue they have, it's a trust issue. But it's the most terrifying conversation because we want to assume that we've got good trust. We don't want to acknowledge we don't, but we've got to acknowledge there might be a gap in order to actually work on it. So number one is, how are we going to enhance trust? And are we paying attention to the ways we're breaking trust every day? Number two is about impact awareness and responsibility. Recognizing that we, especially as leaders in positions of leadership, Every single day, we have an impact on the organization, on the culture, the individual people and their experience, and to pay more attention and intention, pay attention and be more intentional about the impact we want to create. 
And when we have an impact that maybe we didn't intend to take responsibility for it, like to me, it's not acceptable for a leader to say, hey, that's not what I meant, Chad. Mm -hmm. I had an impact on you. I said something or I didn't say something or did it a certain way that caused you to feel less than fully valued. If I dismiss that, then I'm dismissing you. So one is the second one is impact awareness and responsibility. And the third, which is a, a huge one for me, is to pay more attention to our tolerance factor. Now, first of all, I want to be really clear. I believe from a diversity and inclusion and belongingness, we need to be more tolerant of our differences. However, what we're doing a poor job of is we are tolerating so many things and situations and people, and that's setting the bar for our organization. So the example is you say, well, we've got this great team, but I've got this manager who regularly is verbally abusive to the team mm -hmm. because they're a high performer. But because I tolerate that, what I'm saying is it's okay to treat our people with lack of respect here and to verbally abuse them. Mm -hmm. We say we value this, but we're tolerating this person or this situation. And my phrase that I use is this, that our culture, our leadership, and our impact and our outcomes are determined not by what we say, not by what we do, but by what we, what and who we actually tolerate. Mm -hmm. And I want people to pay more attention to diminish and minimize that tolerance to recognize what that's creating in their team and organization. Yeah, it's. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There was a, another gentleman that I spoke to that was a, a leader of a large organization, and, and I think the way that he put it was uh, that, that it, culture is less about what you say and more about what you allow. Um, exactly. And, and when that becomes the case, then the, that's what people are going to uh, understand is, is the norm. Just a reminder, you're listening to the Coffee Break Podcast. Also, we wanted to let you know that our team puts together a weekly blog post. You can find it at locdoc.net slash blog. It's guaranteed to raise your IQ by 12 points or your money back. So it's pretty much a win-win. All right, back to the conversation. I wanted to, to move into, uh, and I think you started down this path very interestingly, um, and, and you were noticing some of the books on, on the desk here just a little bit ago. And one of the books that you were asking about was, is that the five dysfunctions of a team from uh, Patrick Lencioni? Yeah. Within that, and at the, at the bottom fu foundational component of that is, is, a, is building trust. So you've already started, down, started me down this path. So <laughs> I'm going to hold you accountable for triggering me on this, but uh, the, the avoidance of accountability. So yeah. uh, and this is something that, that you talk about. How is it, and this is a gap, I believe, that we're at in, in a lot of different ways, and I have these conversations with business leaders quite frequently. <laughs> How is it that you hold people accountable? You don't. That's the problem. You absolutely don't. And one of the questions I love to ask business owners, because I know what the answer is going to be, is to say, how are you guys doing with accountability? Because mm -hmm. the best answer I've ever gotten is, yeah, we can probably do better. Mm -hmm. That's the best answer. But I hear it constantly. So we need to do a better job of holding our people accountable. I said, mm -hmm. no, you don't. In fact, if you're holding people accountable, you're doing their job for them. What you need to do is create a, I call it a culture of self-accountability, where people consistently do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. When that happens, you don't need to hold people accountable. And the journey to that kind of culture is a lot shorter than you think but it requires doing something differently. That's for sure. And what is that? What is what is the the thing that you're doing differently? Because I, I've had these conversations with our leadership team. I, this is a back and forth that we go, go go around all the time. Is we're all adults here. You know, we all understand the goals and the the outcome that we're working towards. It's up to you to decide if you're going to do this or not. So I, I do I do workshops on this, just so you know, Chad, that are typically four to eight hours. Okay. But I'm going to shorten it down to a few words. Uh, and I'm happy to highlight each one of these. First is it's we're going to talk about commitments. We're going to talk about choices. And we're going to talk about impact. And before I go into those, I'm going to come back. And the starting point is people need to recognize that every human being on the planet, 
including you, Chad. I know that you you think you're different, just like me. Think I think I'm different. Every one of us has a part of us that doesn't want to be accountable. Mm-hmm. The, when someone says, "Oh my God, I love accountability," go, "Oh my God, we're in trouble," because they've got a blind spot. Because the reality of accountability is that when you're fully accountable. That means there's nowhere to hide. That means that you every single time do exactly what you said you're going to. Mm. And no human being does that. If people are honoring every commitment they make, they need to make more commitments. The question is, what are you doing when you miss those commitments? So the first thing is to recognize we all have an objection to accountability because accountability is hard. That means you can't make any excuses. See, there's no reasons or excuses with accountability. There's only choices. So back to the, I'll do the short version here. Number one is I encourage people to literally start using the word commit and commitment. So you don't tell people what to do. You ask them for commitments using that word. So if I'm talking to you instead of saying, Chad, I need this by Friday at Mm -hmm. noon or worse, I say, I need this Friday. Well, when's that due? We're not clear and specific because we don't want to be. I want an out. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say, hey, I need a commitment from you, Chad. Let's talk about it. When can you commit to have this to me? Mm -hmm. You say Friday. I said, I don't know what that means, Chad. When exactly will you have this to me? Well, I'll try to get it to you by three. No, no, not one of your – when will I be guaranteed I'll have it? Mm -hmm. Well, there are no guarantees, Jeff. Yes, there are, Chad. That's accountability. (laughs) Hmm. Right. Yes, sir. So I want to make commitments because commitments, when, when I say to someone, hey, I need to talk to you about a commitment, they go, oh, my God, that's a big deal because it's not a project. It's a commitment. Mm-hmm. Number two is when people miss their commitments, we go to a single question. We get first of all, we get rid of the most the worst possible question on the planet. Here's the one you would never want to ask this question again. So, Chad, why didn't you get this done on time? That's that's basically like saying, Chad, can you give me every possible excuse you can think of? Mm -hmm. None of which has anything to do with you, by the way. Well, this came up and I ran out of time and Bob called and Jane called. And no, it's a single question. So, Chad, what did you choose to do instead of honoring this commitment? And the first answer is going to be, well, I didn't choose this. But if people can't understand that it's the choices they made that kept them from honoring the commitment, it's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and next week and next month because it's all about external, uncontrolled circumstances. Mm -hmm. We got to help our people say, no, there were choices that were made and there's always choices. And the final is the impact that when when people miss their commitments, we're going to ask them questions about the impact. So what's the impact, Chad? of you not honoring this commitment? What's the impact on you, on the team, on me? And it's always going to come down to some element of trust. And when you can look me in the eye and say, you know what, Jeff, because I didn't honor this commitment, you probably trust me a little less. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, you know what? You're right. I do trust you less. No one on the planet wants to say to someone else, you trust me less. But when we're honest about that, people honor their commitments. And they're thoughtful when they make them and they look for ways to make better choices. That's the secret sauce right there. I like it. Uh, The first three of our core values for our organization is uh, number one, defining expectations. Two is consistent communication. And the third one is to cultivate trust. Uh, So that's a big foundational component of our organization and what we're trying to work on, uh, because we believe that if we build trust with each other inside of our organization, then it'll be an automatic that we're building trust with our customer base. So uh, it's it's an interesting focus point. Having the ability to uh, have commitments. There was a there was a a conversation that we had uh, in our organization months back about choices. So you all make choices and you make hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them every day. So what are what is that criteria by which you're making those choices and that you ultimately end with the outcome or the impact, essentially, in, in your words, uh, that you've chosen? So that's that's big. I, that's that's a that's a lot to unpack in a in a very short podcast here. It is. It is. And it's, but it's so vital. So it's a, I I like to simplify things. I think ultimately it's simple, but it's challenging because we're not used to these conversations. And like when I do these workshops, 
we'll not only we'll talk about accountability, we'll give them new tools, but we'll practice this. Mm -hmm. We'll practice those conversations because people need to learn how to have a different conversation with someone when they're when they're avoiding the choice. How do you how do you follow through with them? How do you talk to them? And the big thing is for for leaders and to me, leaders or anybody in a position to influence others is leaders need to model this. That means telling the truth on yourself. Mm -hmm. That means not waiting for the rest of the team to talk to me, but to say for me to come into a meeting in front of everybody and say, you know what, Chad, I told you that I would call you back by by the end of the day Mm -hmm. on Monday, which, by the way, I don't like that one end of the day. What does that mean? (laughs) Does that depend on when I leave? Why are we afraid to have a specific time? It's because we don't want to be accountable. Mm. I want to have some, I want some freedom in here. But I say, you know what, Chad, I didn't call you by five o'clock yesterday. Uh, The choice I made was, uh, it's not, I can't say I got caught up in stuff because that's not a choice. I chose to ignore the, the thing that popped up on my calendar. Oh, you know what? I chose not to put it on my calendar as a reminder. Mm-hmm. I chose to rely on my memory. Mm-hmm. So I did forget, but the choice was I chose not to document it in some way to assure that I would be reminded. What was the impact? You pro- you know what? You probably don't trust me when I say I'm going to do something. You probably got delayed on a project, which made your job a little harder. You know what? It probably touched a couple other people that you couldn't get back to. Mm-hmm. So I created this ripple of trust. And that's not how I want to be. And going forward, I intend to show you every day how I am someone who honors their commitments. So people go, oh, my God, he's the boss. And he just told the truth on himself. So it's okay for me to tell the truth. But most importantly, are we actually going to do this or not? Yeah, most we definitely keep playing the game. Having a high level of vulnerability in front of a team is is massive. I, there's a there's a gentleman that I had a conversation with before just to kind of sum up everything that you were just saying is it, it, and it cracked me up because it's so true. He said, if you're not willing to put a date and a time on it, then just go ahead and crumble it up and throw it in the trash can because it's not going to happen. And it's like it's going back to what you're talking about commitments. If you can't, if you have a fear of committing to something and making it happen, then you really have, I guess, don't have a whole lot of buy into actually making sure that it does come to tr- come to fruition. Well, and that's the the, the proof of how hard more, it is simple, but it's challenging. Is the I did this workshop for a company a number of years ago, and the two owners called me. Let's say it was on a Thursday. So they called me on Monday and I, they said, Jeff, boy, this was hard. <laughs> we said, why? And I said, well, they said, well, we started doing this. When we got back to the office. It took us 45 minutes to get a commitment from one of our team members. <laughs> I said, wow, that's OK, but I'm not surprised what happened. And they said some of the things I just used. We went to them and said, when can you get it to us? We'll try our best to get it to you by Friday afternoon. We'll win on Friday afternoon. We'll try our best to get it to you by three. Well, no, that's not a commitment. And then they started playing the word games with them and said, well, we commit to do our best to get it to you by three o'clock on Friday. And they were like upset with us. Mm-hmm. And we realized how we've not done a good job of this because this is like a foreign language. That they sound right. It is because mm. you've never asked them to make commitments. And so you're exercising a new muscle around commitments and choices and what does it really mean to be accountable because good people and most of the people in our companies are good people. They want to honor their commitments and they do want to be accountable, but there's that voice that says, I don't want to be accountable. Mm -hmm. I want to keep this loose because I want to have an out that I don't have to do. Like there are times for me, what's shown up in my life is what accountable means is it's, it's one in the morning. And I remember something and I stay up till three in the morning to honor a commitment. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to stay up till three, but it meant honoring my commitment. And the next time I make different choices to say, I don't really want to start this at one. Mm-hmm. So what were the choices I made? Cause it's easier to not be accountable. Yeah. That's why I, frankly, when someone, this is what happened on LinkedIn yesterday, someone was posting, I posted something about accountability and, they were saying, well, I love accountability. It's always about accountability for me. I'm thinking, yeah, uh-huh. let me talk to your friends. Let me talk to your, your husband. She happens to be married. Let me find out if you do it all the time. Mm. We're going to find out. You're going to get the eyes rolling. Yeah, no. 
<laughs> well, I, I think what you're saying is is a practical way to go about it as well from a commitment standpoint and then holding people accountable because I, it, and it gives me some language to kind of understand and process it in in the conversations that I'm having because I've always been challenged with I if is so as long as I set the outcome based objective, the goal that we're trying to accomplish, then that's what I'm holding you accountable to. And if you choose not to do that, then, and it goes back to the choice thing, if you choose not to do that, then that's on you. Like we agreed, this is where we're headed and this is what we're going to do. If you've chosen not to do that, then it stinks for you that you're going to be left out of, you know, out of the outcome uh, of that. Well, let me show you, throw a twist at you, Chad, at okay. the risk of getting under your skin oh. <laughs> with that. I'm, I'm a thin slicer. I borrowed that term from Malcolm Gladwell. I think I use it a little differently. And when I think about accountability, one of the things I say that people aren't used to hearing is someone cannot be accountable for results, mm -hmm. in my opinion. They can be accountable for actions required to achieve those results. They can be responsible for results, but not accountable. And here's the difference. Accountability to me is about integrity. I made a promise to you. And if I don't honor that promise, I'm out of integrity with you. I'm not just out of account. I made a promise that I didn't honor. Mm. And that's why it works, because someone's making a personal promise to another human being. But that's the, when someone says, for example, if I said, Chad, here's your goal, and I, particularly if I give you no input, mm -hmm. and I say, you didn't achieve your goal, so you're not an accountable person, that feels harsh because you didn't control all of it. Mm -hmm. What I am going to do is here's the 10 steps that we believe will take to achieve that outcome, mm -hmm. and you can commit to those, and you can be accountable, un, out of account for doing those, and you can be responsible for not hitting the outcome. But those are very different to me because it's about integrity. Most definitely. I love that. Uh, it's something from a self-awareness side of things that you have apparently been uh, hanging out in our office over the last couple of months because uh, we've been going down this path of understanding that um, we have to be very focused and intentional about documenting and outlining the the steps to get to the plan that we're trying to achieve and all too often uh folks of of a certain uh of a certain type assume all right that everybody understands all of the plans and and the steps that they've somehow surmised inside their plan or inside their head and they have not clearly communicated it and so if you've not clearly communicated it which goes back to again kind of our core value number one don't be frustrated with unmet expectations if you haven't clearly defined them uh, then then you're you're just uh, simply setting up uh, failure for your entire team because the, the plan has not been clearly defined exactly and you said earlier one of your core values is about clear expectations mm -hmm. I love that a lot of people are not clear with their expectations and then they expect people to comply with them I think well why very cool very true, very true. Jeff, I, I, I want to appreciate your time. You have unpacked, a, I think, a very fundamental component here. When, it, when we talk about commitment and holding people accountable, I think you know, one of many things that people struggle with in the, in the realm of, of managing a business is that. One, you know, finding good people and, and building that team. But once you have those people there, even if they're the best people in the world, if you're not on the same page with, uh, with defining commitments and holding people accountable to achieve those, things, then uh, you're still going to have struggles. So I, I definitely appreciate you unpacking that with us uh, today. Um, you've got a lot of information online. You've got, you said that you do some workshops, you've got some coaching programs. Tell us a little bit about, hey, if, if somebody's listening to this or watching this and they go, hey, Jeff is a guy that I need to get in contact with to, to help us out with, with certain things. What is the process of doing that? Oh, it's pretty easy. As long as you can spell my last name, which is <laughs> N-I-S-C-H-W-I-T-Z. You can go to my website, which is nishwitzgroup.com. You can email me, jeff at nishwitzgroup.com. Uh, easy to find me. And uh, I have a unique last name. So if you Google me, pretty much you're going to find me, not somebody else. Oh, there you go. And we'll definitely uh, put a link to the uh, the website in the description, wherever you're watching or listening to this. So be sure to, to check that out. Jeff, I, I really appreciate it. You've got several books. Uh, what's the what's the latest book and, and what is kind of the concept around it if people want to read more? 
Uh, the most recent book, which came out in 2020, uh, is called Just One Step, Walking Backwards to the Present on the Camino Trail. And it is about ways to live and lead differently. Uh, so it's not just about positional leadership. It's about life leadership, life livingship. But it's told against the backdrop of the story of me going to Spain a couple of years ago to walk a few hundred miles on something called the Camino de Santiago, which is a walking pilgrimage. So it's a kind of a memoirish about the walk and people I met and lessons I learned. But most important, it's about some different ways you can live today and you don't have to go walk a couple hundred miles in Spain. You can read the book. Very cool. Well, Jeff, thanks again for joining us today. It was a blast. Uh, great conversation. Thank you again to Marcy Rader for the connection and for the recommendation. Uh, great, great information that you shared with us today. If you would like to find out more about Jeff or connect with him, make sure you do so in the link uh, in the uh, description below or in the show notes. Uh, you can find out more about him by clicking the links that are listed on our website at lockdoc.net slash podcast. If this is the first time that you're watching or listening to this, we've got over 100 other episodes on these very similar topics about leadership, about business operation management, uh, practices and 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 uh, strategies for your organization. So make sure you check that out. It's all available at lockdoc.net so slash podcast. Life leadership, life Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time right here Spain, on the Coffee Break walk Podcast. A few hundred miles on something called the Camino de Santiago which is a walking pilgrimage. So it's a kind of a memoirish about and lessons I learned.